hit record. <laughs> it's not TMI, Julie. It's not at all. <laughs> this is what we were just, it was highly relevant and on topic. That's exactly it. Welcome everybody. Come on in. It's nice to see some familiar names. Uh, we are excited for our session today, right at the top of the hour. So I think that we are perfectly ready, well equipped. I see more people coming on in uh, to get started. Well, great. Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Kalia Garrido, and I head up marketing and events here at Great Data Mines, which is now a Hype 2 company. Uh, if you don't know us already, Great Data Minds is a collective of passionate data activists, and we are on a mission to modernize the world of data. We do this in two ways. The first is that we have our services arm. This is where we do strategic planning, education, and the deployment of critical data projects, and that's at Hype2. Um, and then in addition to the data services, Hype2 is a fully functional, best-in-class innovation consultancy specializing in digital transformation strategy, design, implementations. Uh, we are a proud Salesforce partner and can assist your company with a variety of technical projects. So check us out over at hike2.com. And then when it comes to uh, the data and analytics community, content, events, and conversation, this is where you can find us at greatdataminds.com. This is where we host our events, we run our videos and podcasts with transformational thought leaders and innovative technologies, just like we're gonna do today. So a little bit of housekeeping as we get started. This is a webinar, so of course your cameras and microphones are off, but we welcome you to submit your questions in the Q&A or in the chat throughout the session. We will reserve a little bit of time at the end of the session for a more formal Q&A if you'd like to wait for that. Um, we're also recording today's session and we're going to share it back out with everybody, so please stay tuned for a follow-up email after this. Uh, and today we are, as I mentioned, very excited to host the next episode in our interview series. So please allow me to do some introductions for our esteemed guests. First, we have Morgan Llewellyn, and he is absolutely a true data and AI visionary. Uh, Morgan is an expert at diagnosing customer challenges and implementing unique, durable, and sustainable data and AI solutions for government. That's what we're going to learn about today, as well as healthcare, software as a service, the Internet of Things, retail, manufacturing clients. Uh, Morgan has held a variety of positions as a chief data scientist, chief operating officer, chief data and strategy officer. Um, he has a bachelor's from Hope College and a PhD from Caltech. No big deal. Uh, yeah. Welcome, Morgan. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah. Uh, and of course, my partner in crime is Mr. Mike Lampa. He is our chief analytics officer here at Hike2. Uh, Mike is an accomplished transformation agent with a specialty in modernizing enterprise data and analytics programs. He's got over 20 years of experience as a data and analytics practitioner, both as a consultant and as an employee in Global 100 Enterprises. And he has worked in a bunch of different and diverse industries, including banking and financial services, industrial manufacturing, high-tech telecommunications, oil and gas retail, consumer packaged goods. Uh, Mike's expertise lies in the selection and implementation of modern technology tools and platforms. Um, and uh, he's my partner in crime for doing these Great Data Minds interviews that also get published to YouTube and are distributed on a variety of different podcast channels. So check us out there. And with all of that said, Mike, please do take us away. Thank you, Kalia. <clears throat> and uh, I noticed that we also have a, a uh, cat grooming service, right? We do. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Morgan, how are you, my friend? I'm doing great. I'm just thrilled to hear that this is going to be on YouTube because then I can tell my kids they can watch me on YouTube. Yeah, so that, on YouTube. That's, that's great. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know, um, back to uh, the introduction uh, of you, Morgan, uh, as a visionary, I swear, you know, we've been interacting more and more uh, as the weeks go on and I get new brain wrinkles every time I talk to you in this space around Gen AI as, as we're all learning you know, the applicability and what the stuff is. Um, so I appreciate that. You're a great mentor. That, that's very kind. I mean, it's really exciting what we're seeing going on in the industry from my perspective. So I've been in the, call it data science, you know, um, AI, ML space for about 20 years now. 
Mm-hmm. And it's just so exciting to see where we've come and where we are um, from where we started, you, you know, a decade, two decades ago. It is mm-hmm. just fantastic. And what I think is so exciting is that AI is becoming, you know, for lack of a better term, it's democratized and you're seeing a knowledge revolution happening. Mm-hmm. And it's just really exciting to see so many people see opportunities to apply AI to their professional lives, to their professional personal lives and it's just a great time to to be in this space yeah it truly is um, i'm so excited i've been excited for the last five years with all the technology revolution and then this one shows up in july or january of this year um uh, and my partner julie says what's our offer yeah <laughs> what are we gonna do in gen ai I, was like, I don't know what gen AI is yet so um very cool space so let, let's unpack it just a little bit what is gen ai and and let's let's kind of put it in context of you know state and local and education. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's start just generally. What is Gen AI? And and we don't have to go to you know too into the weeds in it. But you know essentially, I think if you think about it from like images and creating images, uh, that could be the easiest way to to wrap your head around it. At some level, you know, at a very high level, it's pattern matching. So I have a picture of a cat. Is this other thing a picture of a cat? And then generate me you know, another picture of a cat. And so generate me something that looks like this other thing. And that ultimately is what Gen AI is at, at, you know, a very high level. It's doing some pattern matching, but being able to generate patterns that match other patterns that we've seen before. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, at a picture level, it's very, you know, kind of easy to understand. Here's a picture of a cat. Give me a picture of a cat where it gets really interesting and applicable to, you know, kind of state and local government and public sector in general is how can you use that same idea and that same concept to be able to operate over languages? Mm -hmm. And that's where you see something like a large language model come in that is able to, you know, through this idea of pattern matching, be able to understand what you're asking and then be able to understand what is an appropriate response to the thing you're asking. And so now you're not necessarily generating another picture of a cat, you're generating an answer to a question that looks like answers to those questions you've seen before. Mm -hmm. And that essentially is is what we're talking about. Yeah, So, so why is it important in the state and local and you know, public sector education space? Yeah, so so large language models are important for state and local government. They're important really for all of business. And the reason why they're so important is the second L in that in that acronym, right? The language portion. Mm-hmm. And so large language models, what they really do is help you understand um, you know, unstructured data. They help you understand data really well. Um, think of all the website content and all the documents and the, you know, all those unstructured notes and healthcare files and, uh, you know, caseworker files. Large language models help you understand that information, be able to summarize it, be able to get insights, be able to question and answer it very quickly. And so it's the the focus on language and the ability to get insight out of you know, all those notes that you've had before that you've never been able to structure and get information out of, that's really what large language models are going to allow us to do is be able to get greater insight out of the data we already have in a way we've never been able to do it before, Mm -hmm. um, you know, in a very robust and consistent way. Yeah, and I mean, there was a big wave eons ago, it seems, right, around electronic document management systems, right? And the promise of optimal, optimal, optical <laughs> character yep. rec- recognition and natural language processing has the effective use of large language models help us getting uh, it, it, are they helping us get to that holy grail that we we never realized with OCR and natural language processing yeah OCR and and really kind of previous iterations of you know some of the data science implementations um, of understanding language they're somewhat brittle Right. They're, they're brittle. And, you know, this is what we're expecting. We're expecting to see, you know, this ID number in the top right corner. We're expecting to see a dollar amount down here. And, you know, OCR is somewhat brittle in that sense mm. and very comparable to previous iterations of uh, language models. They were somewhat brittle in that 
they could have been just like pure keyword, right? I'm looking for this specific keyword. If the keyword's not there, it breaks. Mm -hmm. What large language models allow us to do is really uh, put together a more flexible format to understand documents. And it understands um, similarity in a way that these previous technologies just didn't do. And so if you mm -hmm. change something slightly, large language models are able to um, adjust for it. And so, yes, the real promise here with large language models is they're not as brittle. They're um, more applicable to a greater number of documents without having to have a bespoke solution for every one of those documents. I want to, yeah. you know, I have a document I want to understand, you know, DMV transactions. And so I need to have an OCR or I'm going to, you know, write a specific model for that. And then I need another one for my caseworker over in child services. Large language models get you away from the that need to train a model specific to every single use case. It's much more flexible, much easier to deploy, much easier to maintain. And, and this is feeling very applicable to this domain because I'm pretty much document centric, document heavy, unstructured content heavy. Yes, exactly. And, you know, I've, I've got a, quite a bit of experience in the public sector, um, particularly some of the, you know, some of the work I'm most proud of is in child services, where there's a lot of really important information locked in those note fields. And previously, we just, we couldn't develop the algorithms to really be able to understand what is the important information in those notes sections? Yeah. It, it was just too hard. There's too much. It's too varying. It, it was just too hard. And with something like an LLM, it allows you to take a look at those types of documents, extract information, and be able to summarize it um, in, a, in a very efficient and reliable way that we just didn't have before. And so it, you know, these LLMs present an opportunity, again, to get insight into the data you already have that you've never been able to do that in some cases like child services those notes have real impacts on people's mm -hmm. lives in having a better understanding of that case is better for everyone involved yeah i love the purpose of that outcome thank you for your service to our to our constituents out there yeah and 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 the space also is is kind of people constrained right so the, the ability to level up the efficiency and the accuracy of these insights? Yeah, that's what we, we hear from a lot of folks in the public sector is, you know, one of the, the big opportunities is you're exactly right. Public sector is, you know, it's people constrained. It's hard to get people into the public sector. And so anything for that can help drive efficiency and, you know, not not to reduce headcount, just to make people more efficient is a win-win. It's better for government, it's better for employees, but it's also better for the citizens and the residents who are getting services um, mm -hmm. more efficiently now as well. And so, yes, there's a there's a massive, I think, you know, and I think you see this more in the public sector than even the private sector. There's a recognition that the efficiency advantage is really good for public sector. Um, and it's good for the employees themselves. It's not about replacement. This is about being able to augment and you know take some of that workload off of the individuals mm -hmm. and be able to provide better services at the same time. So I'm I'm getting you know it's cool we get these insights like you know I'm going to use this, you know, my personal uh, experiences I interact with Chat GPT probably probably eighty percent of my Google queries are now going to Chat right and I love the insights it gets out of me up back to me. And then I started thinking, well, how do I take this and drive it into my work? Is there a workflow integration piece behind this to really get to that scale? Yeah, I, I think this is a really important point. And I'll approach it from a slightly different, from a slightly different perspective. And it is, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, what is, you know, what are people doing in Gen AI? What are people doing with Chat GPT? And I think your use case is perfect where you know, whether you like it or not, your employees, you have employees out there who are using these tools and they might be using them in a perfectly acceptable way or they might be introducing danger um, to the organization just in, you know, what they're, how they're interacting with it. Mm. And that's not to say that you should, you know, squash out and prohibit it because there's risk. The opportunity is how do you give employees guidelines around how to appropriately interact with these tools? Mm. And that I think is, is what's really necessary for a lot of organizations. 
And you're seeing governments actually starting to take that step. Yeah. You're seeing, you know, Canada take that step. You're seeing even, uh, I think Kansas has a, a set of outlines over how to interact with um, AI. Mm -hmm. uh, you're seeing the Government Services Administration. They're also, you know, laying out guidelines around interacting with, um, um, you know, types of generative AI like GPT. And I think the, the thing that the consistent thread you see across all these are, you're not seeing, you know, government entities saying you can't use these. What they're, what you're seeing is you're seeing uh, government entities provide policies and guidelines over appropriate, um, you know, appropriate use or appropriate consideration of potential use. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, hey, here are the, like the, you know, here are the off limits things you can't do. You can't put in PII or you can't, um, you know, you can't put in PHI into a publicly available endpoint. And so they're not even saying, you know, some of these, they're not even saying you can't use them for more advanced use cases, but they're being very specific around what are the types of endpoints and the data securities data security solutions you need to be thinking about. Yep. So I'm a data guy. Um, these large language models, they seem like this, this perfect storm and it has an easy button. But my spidey sense tells me there's some data prep work that we have to take into consideration. Yeah, your, your spidey sense is correct. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I, so let's approach it from the data science side first, and then let's talk about it from the data side and the data engineering and the pipeline. Mm -hmm. From the data science side, look, you know, again, if we go back even five, 10 years, every use case that we approached, we needed to train a model for and a new model. So, okay, you want to go and look at, you know, the, the amount of time it's going to take a child to sit, achieve a safe and permanent living situation. Go build a model for that. Okay, you want to go and build a model um, to identify, you know, tax fraud. Go build a model for that. And so everything has its own specific model. And that even applied um, often to our understanding of language. I want to understand, you know, what's important in these notes. I need to build a model um, to do that. Large language models do a lot of the heavy lifting from a data science side. Mm -hmm. The frozen models, quote unquote frozen, that means pre-trained models that are out there are actually really good at understanding language. They're very good at understanding language. And where they can fall down and have some issues is in you know, things like you might have heard the term hallucination, where it yeah. just starts making stuff up, right? Mm -hmm. And, and that's really not the fault of the model is what I would say. It's really the application of the model and, you know, kind of misuse of the model. And so this is where the, the data side and the data engineering and the pipeline is so important because you've got a model out there, right? You've already got this trained model that can be pretty effective. What you need to do is focus on your data engineering and your data, your data prep. How do you prepare your data and make that data available to the large language model in a way that um, constrains risk? And so rather than asking you know, a model, show me every single document across the entire state or across the entire country, you know, being able to tell that model, look, you only need to consider responses from these three documents. And because these are the three documents that are relevant to your question. Mm -hmm. And so being able to constrain that model um, using approaches called, um, you know, grounding that model into specific, like, you know, specific documents or specific text is really important. And mm -hmm. it helps give you consistent and reliable results. And it helps put in those guardrails so that, you know, you're not out there asking, you know, how many, how many Martians live on Venus, right? Mm -hmm. And getting a, getting a response. Like that's an inappropriate use of the model. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just talking about the data engineering a little bit more, that's really where a lot of the time um, and effort needs to be spent in ensuring you get consistent and reliable results. Mm -hmm. And that is making sure that you're looking at the right data, you're pointing those large language models at the right data, at the right questions, um, so that you can ensure good results. Yeah, yeah, and, and I've you know, been digesting a lot of research around this. I have a question for you. So I'm not going, I could train a large language model, but I'm, I'm seeing that it's incredibly cost prohibitive and probably not the right way to go. But how do I get it to be more accurate in finding the things I'm looking for? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. You're right. With enough time and money, you could train your own LLM. 
I, I don't think any of us, you know, on this call have that amount of time and money, mm -hmm. but you could. Um, alternatively, what you could do is doing what we're talking about here, taking a, a grounded approach where you're pointing that large language model at the documents of interest. And so there we can start talking about data architecture and being able to search across. I have a query, right? I'm interested in, you know, what are the you know car registration rates in the state of California? How do, how do I then look at just the documents that are relevant or the websites that are relevant to um, car registration costs in the state mm -hmm. of California? And you pull back those couple of documents and that's where you tell the large language model, hey, here's a bunch of documents that I think are relevant to car registration costs in California. Take a look at those and tell me what the registration rate is for my particular vehicle or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so it's basically using a search. Think of it as, you know, I, I always like to joke, it's, it's like Google search. Think about using a Google search up front to be able to identify the web pages you're interested in or the documents you're interested in. And then you throw the LLM underneath that and say, okay, now go look across all these things and answer the question I'm actually interested in mm -hmm. instead of having to click through every single document to try and try and do that. Mm -hmm. So you're hinting to my brain anyway, that there's another, potentially there's a, other technologies to bring to bear as part of getting optimized experience from these large language models. Yes, that is correct. And dear Mike, I think you are leading the, uh, you know, you're, you're leading the witness. Um, but yes, 100%. There's a technology called vector databases. And that's what vector databases do. So you can think about, you can take your documents and you can vectorize information in those documents. And when you vectorize that information, essentially what you do is you make it very um, you know, quickly searchable where you can search for similar things. So now I've got a query again, I'm looking for um, you know, uh, car registration rates in California. I vectorize that query. And when I do that, I turn it into a whole bunch of math. And now I've got all these you know, publicly available websites or documents or whatever. I've got those available and I've also vectorized those and essentially turned them into math as well. So I've taken the words and I've converted them into math. Mm -hmm. And now all it does is it looks at the, these two vectors uh, and does a similarity search of how similar is this math, you know, is how similar is five to four? Hey, five and four are much more similar than five and 20. So this four element, you know, that's the, that's the most similar. And mm -hmm. so you're doing this similarity search. But again, the way I like to talk about it is it's really good. Think about it as Google, right? Mm -hmm. You're basically doing a Google search up front and saying, hey, tell me all the documents I'm looking for that are the most relevant. And then I'm going to go ask the LLM to answer all the questions. Mm -hmm. All right. So... I also have been picking up uh, that there's, there's some new rigor and discipline that, that we have to be accountable or uh, that we have to account for around when I'm interacting with, with the user interface, when I'm prompting for information. Yeah. So what you want to think about is when you're, when you set up your LLM, um, you know, or really when you set up your workflow or the process you're looking for, because the LLM is just one small piece of it. Mm. Um, you know, whether you're looking to have a UI that uh, interacts with an individual or whether you're setting up a fully automated solution where the individual doesn't necessarily re interact with it, the LLM is just one small piece. It's all those other pieces, the, you know, the data engineering, that data prep, the vector database combined with the, you know, kind of that human in the loop approach. Those are what makes the LLM, you know, really, really the superstar. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, setting up UI, UX, the ability to interrogate and understand, are we asking the right, you know, am I getting the right results? Is that not the right result? Why is it not the right result? Mm -hmm. And so having a flexible UI, UX to be able to consume the information being presented by the LLM, but then also to interrogate it and provide transparency over, well, why did you give me that answer? And mm -hmm. I think that's something that we see very specifically in the, the public sector where, in some cases, they're not able to give information um, that isn't um, publicly available and been verified. And so essentially the great thing about LLMs is at, in the UI UX space, you can provide what I like to jokingly refer to as receipts. 
and you can say, okay, you know, Morgan, here's the here's the cost of registering your car in California. Here's specifically the website and the location that we we found that information. And I think that's incredibly valuable and very different than what we've seen previously. Again, in the ML, you know, kind of traditional ML AI space, where it was kind of a black box on the why is this the right answer. With an LLM, you can say specifically, show me the receipt. Tell me why this is a good. Um, tell me this is why this is the right answer and a good yeah, answer. Yeah, why it's relevant and everything. Yeah, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. Um, so there are concerns. You know, we we, we got to put them out there. You know, we hear them all the time. There's concerns around exposing uh, sensitive or private data to a uh, an open large language model. So there's there's some discipline around what you feed uh, as even as a prompt into the model because it's trying to learn from from our, our prompt interaction. Um, what how would you how would we guide leaders to downplay the concerns and level up the awareness of what to do and not do? Yeah, I, I think I think this is we see kind of two. I would say we see two hesitations around LLM from a security or risk perspective. The first is what you're talking about, just, you know, kind of traditional data security and leaking PII, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's one flavor. And the other flavor we, we tend to see is bias, like concerns about, okay, well, does this put me at risk for some sort of bias depending on my industry? And so am I giving biased results? And I think the important thing to, you know, point out in both of these cases is neither one of them are new. So neither one of these these concepts are new. We've always had data security, um, you know, concerns, and there's always been data security risk. And we have well, you know, well documented, well developed methods for how we do with deal with that. So whether that be, hey, there's a there's a process to scrub PII from the notes, or you know, there's um, you know there's you can only use tls and some of these other security protocols mm -hmm. so that's one approach and you know similar on the bias on um you know just the overall algorithm bias that there's known hey these are the things you can and can't do so i think the first thing to to point out is none of this is new and it's not like we're introducing a new risk and it's it's also not the case that we don't have methods developed to mitigate that risk mm -hmm. and so a lot of the things you're already doing you could do here as well. So just like you can't use PII in an algorithm to predict, um, you know, some financial outcome, you can't. You shouldn't be able to do that same thing in in an LLM, right? And so being able to piggyback off of the regulations we already yeah. have, that mm -hmm. that would be the first thing. Is you know just you know grounding yourself in the fact that this isn't new, and we do have well developed methods to um, you know to address them. Yeah. The second thing I would say, and this gets more into the, okay, well, how do I actually get started here? Yeah. Is, you know, if you look at state, you know, and local governments or government in general, there is an enormous amount of publicly available information. And that could be a place to start is you start with your publicly available information. If you're putting something, you know, you, you can put your security protocols in place, but even if something happens, um, even if you miss something, all you're doing is putting publicly available information into this machine and getting what you know is probably intended to be publicly available information back out. Mm -hmm. And so you're not you're not risking any of that PII, PHI, PCI, because again, if you start from the public sector, right, and, and publicly available data, you've really kind of taken one of the big, you know, kind of bullets out of the chamber, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, as far as risk and concern. And so yeah. that, I think, is a, is a really nice place to start. And there's just a lot of low hanging fruit in the public sector when it comes to how do I help individuals search public information better how do i help them you know read and um, understand public information better yep well and the the, the uh, there's kind of a byproduct of benefit there too because you don't want to try to boil the ocean in this technology space just like we don't try to boil the ocean when we build enterprise data warehouses right um we want to go iteratively and mm -hmm. we want to stop and learn and learn and learn and learn um it feels like that would be a byproduct too, where if I start and I, there's a lot of new things I got to discover about interacting with this technology. If I start with publicly data, 
available data, um, I, I can experiment almost at scale yeah. because I'm a little bit less worried about uh, security breach of, of, of sensitive data. Yeah, and, and there's so many great use cases out there as well that, that you can, you know, it's not just that it gives you a, a safer way to experiment, grow some skills, and then figure out how to use it in some, you know, maybe, you know, maybe a little bit riskier settings. But mm -hmm. there's also a lot of great use cases out there that provide real value to individuals, um, you know, and in, to the residents of the state. Mm -hmm. So are there, are there like, you know, budding frameworks around this whole space i mean yeah we got three decades worth of frameworks we built in the data warehousing and analytics space yeah i think budding is maybe the appropriate use but i i think it's still a little squishy uh mm -hmm. what we're seeing with gen ai and it comes back to you know who's responsible and i think that's something that a lot of organizations are struggling with is who's responsible to set up the framework who's responsible to set up um, the guidelines, is it individual departments? Is it at the state level? I think where we've started to see some success again is where you've had, you know, kind of state authorities or, you know, county or, or city authorities say, okay, here are the ground rules for you to go and evaluate different use cases. But I, I don't think we've really got great frameworks over the adoption of Gen AI. And the challenge that that really brings is it's, it's just an inherent cost or tax, if you want to think of it that way, on every Gen AI project, because we don't have a consistent framework or a consistent way to evaluate these models. Every time we think about, well, can I go use ChatGPT? Well, let me go think about it, right? Well, what are our requirements from a security perspective and you know, from a workflow perspective? And how are these models like developed and trained? And so every time you're evaluating a technology, you're then basically developing your own ad hoc framework and that's extremely costly um, and fairly ineffective mm -hmm. and so while it, it it doesn't exist yet i think we are going to see more of these frameworks being developed for awesome. efficiency uh, alone so are there any are there any um burgeoning communities out there where people are starting to do some mind share Oh, that's a really good question. There are you you see some you see some communities out there um, in the public sector space. Uh, it gets a little bit um, harder, and mm -hmm. so you do see organizations putting together you know kind of thought leadership events and that type of thing. But in the public sector, we haven't seen a lot. There's a couple from um, you know there's some thought leadership coming from you know some of the different consulting firms. I think the the government. Um, the federal government specifically is starting to take a little bit of leadership here. And that would be a place to look at if you're interested um, in developing some guidelines. You can look at, um, you know, kind of Biden's position that that he just signed, as well as I think a, a really nice place is go look at the government, um, the GSA uh, website and uh, recommendations around Gen AI. Nice. Very nice. So one of the calls to action for leadership is is start realizing there's a way to get started and you've got like you said you got this tax around this and build a framework as you're learning right um and contribute back maybe to a community forum uh, so that collectively we all learn how to effectively use this data um what else does leadership need to know when they're looking to lean into this space? I I think, you know, I'm a big proponent of the best ideas are already in your organization. Mm -hmm. And so people, people in your organization have wonderful ideas of how things like Gen AI and LLMs can improve their role or can improve, you know, services more broadly to residents. I'm a huge believer in that, that the best ideas are already in your organization. And so providing a way for individuals to explore safely, I think is the the absolute best thing um, that leaders can do at, at the, you know, kind of the government level, mm -hmm. um, allow those folks to, to explore. From a technical perspective, I would also just throw in a, you know, a plug for something like a co-pilot or some of these other things where you can basically upskill people's coding skills, make them more efficient by being able to use some of these tools. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's there's very tactical things you could do as well. And so mm -hmm. how do you allow folks to be able to leverage these tools um, in a safe and, and reliable way? Mm -hmm. So what's our call to action 
to the audience and to the leaders and the, the people that have all these ideas and they want to get going? Yeah. So if, if you're a leader, the call to action is develop, you know, develop guidelines and share guidelines with the other, you know, the other departments, you know, that, that you're responsible for and give them guidelines over this is how you can evaluate generative AI. And, and by that, I mean, here are kind of the no no's. Right? Like, just don't do these things. These are the off-limit things. Don't, you know, you can say, don't give it PII or don't give it PHI or, hey, we're going to give you a specific account and you have to use this account. But give folks a give folks a path to be able to explore their ideas. We've also seen some really cool things, um, you know, at, at you know, different gov various government um, entities and levels where they're doing hackathons and challenges where they're giving them these tools and then they're coming back and saying, okay, who's got some great ideas? Let's go do them. Uh -huh. And, you know, I, I think, you know, I'm kind of 50-50 on hackathons. I think sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But one thing that I've been um, really impressed by is actually the success of hackathons in this new gen AI space. And I think it really comes back to it's so flexible and when implemented properly, it is consistent and reliable that these hackathons are, are generating, you know, really productive ideas. And, you know, you're starting to see some legs on, coming out of these hackathons. So I think that's a really cool. You could consider that as well. Um, but even if you don't want to go the hackathon route, um, being able to provide people guidelines framework um, to be able to safely evaluate it, that is the number one thing. And then if you're, you know, if you're an individual, um, you know, a developer or, you know, even, a, you know, whether you're in marketing or communications, wherever you are, think about how these tools can be used to improve, you know, to improve your job, right? Like improve your life, if nothing else, like how does it make your life better? And then also how does it make, you know, the residents' lives better as well? Yeah. Well, I guess I would like it to figure out how to cut my lawn for me. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'd make my life a lot better. Oh, that's awesome, uh, Morgan. I appreciate that. Um, and and you know, the, the, the pace of transformation in this space, the technology transformation, the pace is increasing, right? Um, so again, your, your recommendation around give me a safe area so that I can continually, I'm going to say experiment. We always call that MVPs in the data, data warehousing space, but it's really like minimum viable experiments. Is this thing... Uh, worthy of a pursuit. I won't know until I play with it, right? Yeah, that's a that's something also that I I really believe is one of the huge values of putting together guidelines and starting to flesh out frameworks, right? Mm -hmm. Around generative AI is, you know, to your point, the pace of transformation is only increasing. You know, the the pace of innovation is only increasing and if you aren't grounded in guidelines, every new innovation, you're going to have to figure out, is this something I can adopt? Mm -hmm. What isn't increased, you know, what isn't evolving as quickly is our concepts over PII, PHI, PCI. Mm -hmm. And so if we can just agree in our organization or in our department around these are the guidelines for something to be safe and secure, if we can agree at a high level on, you know, can you use PII, PHI, PCI, et cetera, then you can ground yourself there and basically use that as a filter by which to pass all these new technologies, all these new innovations without having to do it on a one-off basis every single time. So enormous efficiency advantages there. Right. So stop creating the new, recreating the new wheel. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you you don't have to you don't have to go and develop that list for every innovation that comes out of okay, what did we need to include in that, right? Just have that stable and have that broadly available. And I would also encourage folks to think about it as, you know, kind of hierarchical where you've got a set of, you know, you've got a, a set of uh, guidelines at maybe a state or a, whatever the, the appropriate local level is, but then individual departments could always add something additional because maybe they've got something additional, some additional data type or some additional security concern. And mm -hmm. so it gives them, you know, it gives those kind of sub departments and sub organizations a framework off of which to build. It doesn't have to be, you know, this is 100% what you have to do it's a starting point though and then you can augment and add to it as needed mm -hmm. All right, i have one more question and it kind of just popped into my head as we've yeah. been talking through um 
uh, my sense is this is an extension of the data and analytics space, but it's a very dynamic new new capability. Um, and we talked about that there is this need for data prep, just like there always has been for in any kind of data analytics space. And then there's some been some hints around you gotta get real good at your your discipline around prompting. Are new roles forming that that our audience needs to be aware of? You know, if they're looking for people with talent. Yeah, you, that's a great question. And, and one term folks may have heard on the call is prompt engineer, you know, and that's a role. Um, you know, I think prompt engineering architecture could be a role. I wouldn't necessarily think that prompt engineering itself is its own role. The way I see it evolving is we're all going to become prompt engineers at some level, right? Just like we all learned to Google and Googling mm -hmm. became a skill, right? Being able mm -hmm. to Google well became a skill. I think that's what, um, you know, kind of prompt engineering is going to look like at some level. We're all going to be prompt engineers having to make sure that we're giving, you know, asking good questions. Uh -huh. That said, I think the, the architecture of prompting, that is going to be a new role. How do you architecture those well? And then I think we also see a divergence. I, or maybe not even a divergence, but just a separation around these vector databases. This is really a different skill than our traditional data engineer or our traditional data science, or even, you know, there's some software engineering in there where there's an understanding of some of the data science that's going on in the vectorization and how do you how do you, um, you know, basically compress these vectors in a cost efficient manner? But there's also a lot of data engineering that goes in of how do I set up a very robust pipeline that can, you know, recognize changes to some source, be able to ingest that, vectorize it. And so it, there really is kind of a hybrid role that's developing. It's not really data scientist. It's not pure data engineer. It's not really even software engineers. It's kind of a combination of the three. Yeah. And that is something that you're seeing come out. It's a, I think, you know, just talking a little bit more about different roles is also, you know, the the role of an AI architect, I think, is starting to emerge as well, where, you know, individuals who can understand how these different pieces fit together, you know, it's kind of a subcomponent of, you know, traditional software architecture, mm -hmm. um, but very much focused on, you know, this gen AI space. Right. Again, got a bunch of new wrinkles in my brain. <laughs> Morgan, thank you for sharing your vision and your passion around this incredibly dynamic space. And uh, I, I feel confident that people are gonna walk away with a little bit more knowledge and some ideas to take away back to their agencies and their organizations. Yep. Yeah, I, I hope so. There's there's so much opportunity in the public space uh, for a tool like a large language model to really make things more efficient at the state level that ultimately provides better services, you know, to the to the residents. And by making things more efficient, makes people's jobs more enjoyable and gets them out of kind of that daily slog into into something a, a little bit more uh, strategic and, yeah. and rewarding. Rewarding. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Morgan. It's always a pleasure to interact with you, my friend. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. yeah, this is a great conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us, Morgan. You have um, such an eloquent way of explaining these big concepts for people to, to really be able to just, you know, take little bites out of it and understand it bit by bit. So we appreciate you um, being here with us. We look forward to doing more sessions with you. And then, Mike, as always, thank you for leading us through this discussion. Um, in the chat, I've added links where people can find the YouTube video when it's going to be um, posted out. And then, of course, always encouraging everybody to connect with us on LinkedIn. If you have any um, Gen AI projects, if you're in the public sector or not, please um, feel free to reach out to us. You can hit us at info at greatdatamines or at hike2.com. Um, and, you know, let us know how we can help. We love doing this stuff and we love yeah. talking about this stuff too. Sure so yeah. thank you, Morgan and Mike. Um, and you. for everybody that is listening, have, we wish you a wonderful day. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye guys. <laughs>